So uh, welcome everyone to the storage session. Should we wait a little bit before starting or just start right now? It's recorded, uh, just start, uh, start the session. Okay, perfect. So thank you all for joining. My name is Tina and I will be one of your presenters today. As you can see in the slide, um, I am a PM at Microsoft uh, on the storage and file systems team specifically. And my main area of focus is storage spaces, storage spaces direct, and also portions of REFS. And joining me today um, as my co-presenter is Andrew. Andrew, did you want to give a brief introduction? Yeah, thanks, Tina. So as Tina said, my name is Andrew Hansen. I am a senior PM lead at Microsoft on the storage and file systems team. And uh, I've helped uh, do lots of storage innovations in a variety of products. Uh, so anything from the Azure host down to like client and edge and IoT devices. Um, and some of the technologies that I've worked on most are storage spaces and REFS. Awesome, thank you for that intro. Um, so moving on to the session agenda, we do have quite a few topics to get through. So we'll be starting off by talking about cluster thin provisioning and also some of the new volume features that is um, coming along in Windows Admin Center. And then we will move on to talking about adjustable repair speeds and Andrew will close off the session with REFS snapshots. So that's an overview of what the next hour will kind of look like. Feel free to leave any questions and we will try and get through those either in the session at the end or follow up afterwards. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start by talking about cluster thin provisioning. So this is a new and exclusive feature that is coming to Azure Stack HCI 21H2. And the main value behind this feature is that it will bring you a ton of management flexibility and also reduce the amount of time that you need to spend on your storage capacity planning. And I will talk more about why this is the case as we get through uh, the rest of the slides. But first, I'm going to tell you about what thin provisioning is. Um, so it's basically a new way for you to provision your volumes. Traditionally, all we've had in the past is fixed provisioning. So on the right hand side in the graphic, you can see that, for example, I'm creating two volumes, one at five terabytes and one at four terabytes. So if I only had 10 terabytes in my entire storage pool, this means that nine terabytes of space will be completely taken up, even though I don't have any files in the volume. So those volumes are empty, but a good portion of my storage pool is already taken up. And with fixed provisioning, as you add files to those volumes, uh, the amount of space used doesn't really change because that space is pre-allocated at the time of creation. So what's new uh, with thin provisioning is that we only take up that space as needed. So as you can see, the same scenario, I have a five terabyte volume, a four terabyte volume, but the amount of space that I'm taking up from the storage pool is very little because it's only the amount of space that REFS needs to pre-map some of the metadata. So with this feature, what you can do is over provision your volumes, which just means that either your single volume can be equal to or greater than the size of your entire storage pool, or you can create multiple volumes. So think you have a four node cluster. What you can do is create four volumes at 10 terabytes each so that you don't have to worry about one volume filling up faster than the other and then having to rebalance afterwards. And so within provisioning, only when you add data to those volumes will we actually take storage from the pool. And once you delete um, a set of data, we will actually give that space back to the storage pool so other volumes can leverage that storage space. And this should happen automatically um, 10 to 15 minutes after file deletion. But if you're really keen to see that space being given back right away, what you can do is run optimize volume slash consolidate as the parameter and see that space being given back and um, your volume optimized. So Moving on um, is the actual demo in PowerShell for what um, was shown in the second part of that graphic. 
So as you can see, I will start off by creating a new volume that is thinly provisioned and uh, five terabytes in size and just with the default three-way mirror configuration. So this volume was successfully created and then I will check the allocated size, the size and the provisioning type. So the allocated size is the amount of space that I'm actually taking from the pool, while the size is the size that I define the volume to be. And what I'm doing next is just adding some files to that volume with fsutil and then rechecking the allocated size. So as you can see, uh, this is where thin provisioning comes in. So the allocated size has increased because I've actually added files to that volume. And if I were to remove those files that I previously created, I should see that space being given back to the pool. So pausing here, you can see that the allocated size has indeed decreased. Um, and I will just note this is a fairly gradual process, so you'll see that value decreasing um, over time and then eventually getting you back to that um, almost empty volume state in, this, in the case of this demo. So yeah, I just wanted to reiterate um, this feature really does bring a lot of management flexibility and also reduces the amount of time that you need to spend on capacity planning. And the great thing about this feature is that you can provision this at the pool level, at the volume level, or at the tier level in PowerShell. So for the pool, you can set this as the pool default. Um, if you're interested in using a mere accelerated parity volume, what you can do is set both of the tiers that you're using to thin and then use those tier templates um, along with the new volume uh, commandlet. And also you can do all of this in Windows Admin Center. The last thing about management is that you can set a alert threshold for thin provisioning. So um, in the case that your used pool capacity has reached over 70%, we will actually send you an alert in Windows Admin Center. And that is kind of a signal that you should be adding more capacity to your pool, um, perhaps scaling up a node or even deleting some of your existing data. Um, so this setting, so to set that actual threshold is only available in PowerShell for now, uh, we are looking into adding this into Windows Admin Center down the road. So in the previous slide, I did mention that you can do um, all of these provisioning in Windows Admin Center. For people who have actually tried this out, you may think, oh, you can only set this at the pool level. You can't actually do this at the volume level. And in fact, um, I have received multiple bugs saying that you can't over provision quite yet in Windows Admin Center. So that is where the new, new volume experience comes in. It is something that we are actively working on and something that you should expect to see later this fall. The main primary thing that um, comes with this update is that you can enable thin provisioning at a volume level. So when you go and actually create the volume, you can select if you want your volume to be fixed or thinly provisioned. And if you select thin provisioning, then you can actually over provision. And we've added in some extra guidelines for what your volume size should be to better adhere to REFS's rules and logic. And then the last uh, more significant change that you'll see is that the footprint parameter um, has been changed to the maximum volume size parameter instead, because when you have thin provisioning, then your footprint at the time of creation doesn't add a lot of value because you're not actually taking up that much space. And the next thing that is new to the new volume experience is we've made some adjustments to the optional features area. So one significant thing is the thin provisioning field that's been added there. And then also we've heard a lot of feedback about adding support for stretch clusters. So previously optional features were not available, but now it will be. And then as an added bonus, uh, we've also heard a lot of feedback about adding nested resiliency as an option for two node and four node stretch clusters. So that is also a part of the new update. And I know that I've just covered a lot in the previous slide. So to summarize everything, I thought a demo would be a great way to showcase the work that has been done. So just pausing here, um, this is cluster manager and then under the volumes tab, if you go to um, inventory and then click on create, you will see the um, create volume pane being brought up in the 
on the right hand side. And pausing here, you can see that the UI hasn't changed drastically. You still have the name, the resiliency, and the size fields. But um, in this case, for resiliency, this just happened to be a two-node cluster. We've added nested two-way mirror and nested mirror accelerated parity in addition to the two-way mirror um, option that has already existed. So if I select nested two-way mirror and I go down to see max volume size on SSD, I'll see that um, this is the max size that a volume can be made. And if I switch back to two-way mirror, you'll see that that value has changed dynamically. And um, we all know two-way mirror is just 50% more of nested. And if you have multiple media types, you can select the media type. Um, in this case, I'll just leave it at SSD. And then I am going to add a size for what I want the volume to be. So pausing here, I want my volume to be 10 terabytes in size, but obviously that is too large. And uh, in comparison, we know that the max volume size that we can make right now is 1.73 terabytes. But what we can do about that is go under more options and then switch from fixed provisioning to thin. And now you'll see that the max volume size has drastically increased to 4.6 petabytes. And um, if we wanted to over provision with a 10 terabyte volume, that is now feasible. I will say um, this does not mean that we recommend creating a 4.6 petabyte volume. It's kind of just acting as the upper ceiling um, and as a guideline. So click and create, uh, just giving WAC a few seconds to create that volume, and then it should show up in your inventory list. And going to the volume settings page or the properties page, you'll see that the total size is 10 terabytes, but the footprint is only 240 um, gigs. And the provisioning type is set as thin, and the resiliency setting is going to be a nested to a mirror. And if we just scroll down to storage tiers, you'll see that um, tiers are used, and this is a nested to a mirror volume. So that actually concludes the part on thin provisioning and uh, also some of the changes that are coming to new volume. Now we are just going to move on to some of the other new features with storage in HCI 21 H2. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about here is adjustable storage repair speeds. The main benefit of this feature is that it will greatly improve your lifecycle management experience and help you get back to full resiliency a lot faster after a patch and update. With this feature, what you can control is the data resync speeds by either allocating some of your resources or more of your resources to um, either repairing data copies so that you can get back to full resiliency or focus them on running active workloads for better performance when you have those mission critical um, workloads that you need to run. There's five settings in total, ranging from very low to very high, and you can see that on the right-hand side. So for very low and low, those correspond to a Q depth of one and two, and this means that most of your resources will go to active workloads. And then if you um, want to set your setting to high or very high, this means that you want most of your resources to go towards resync and repairs. The recommended and default setting is going to be four, and this corresponds to a Q depth of four as well. Oh, sorry, uh, the default setting is medium, and this corresponds to a Q depth of four. And it really is just a balance of workloads and repairs. Um, and we do recommend that you set this back to medium after use. And um, as with thin provisioning, uh, we do want this feature to also have a really great management experience, both in PowerShell and also in Windows Admin Center. So um, as you can see, the PowerShell commandlet for how you can change the repair speeds is shown on the screen. And then in Windows Admin Center, this is available as a cluster manager setting. So you just have to go to cluster manager, settings, storage spaces and pools, and then under the storage repair speeds field is where you'll see this drop down. 
And if any of the information that is shown in either the, this presentation or um, earlier on, um, you want a refresher on that, we do have public documentation available. So all you have to do is just search this up and then um, you will see all of the different PowerShell commandlets, uh, screenshots and instructions there. So that concludes um, the portion of the session on adjustable storage repair speeds. Next, um, Andrew is going to talk about REFS snapshots. Yeah, thanks, Tina, and thanks for those awesome demos. It's exciting new stuff. So for REFS, let's talk about snapshots. Um, some of you are familiar with snapshots, some aren't. Uh, a snapshot is basically just a saved state of some data, and that data can be either in a block form, a file form, or an entire volume. And you might be wondering, how is this different than block cloning? Like REFS has this awesome feature in metadata where they can block clone a file super fast. And the main difference, there's some difference under the hood and, and we'll go into that, but the main difference is that snapshots are meant to be read only, whereas clones of the file can be read and written to. And snapshots also take a constant time, irrespective of file size to take. So you can have a super large VHD, take a snapshot, uh, shot, of that and it's really fast and a very small like text file and it's going to take the same amount of time. Uh, so for those of you who have studied computer science, it's O of one. And uh, you can capture any size of file, so there's no uh, limit on that. And it's currently built into REFS util. So some of you have used REFS util for things like salvage and I'll be showing this in a demo later on. Well, that's where we built the capabilities into currently. Um, and what we have right now is the ability to create a snapshot, delete a snapshot, list the snapshots of the file, and then you can query for modifications to things like virtual cluster numbers or logical cluster numbers. And I'll show you that later in the demo as well. Go to the next slide. All right, so yeah, under the hood. So what, what we've done to implement this it was we've separated the data management from more of the metadata management. And this is through uh, what we call ordered diff chaining of shadow B trees. So if those of you who are familiar with uh, REFS, we use uh, B plus trees all over in REFS with Merkle checksumming, hierarchical checksumming to make sure all the data is correct at any given time. And uh, so what we do is when there's a snapshot of a file, we just create a new shadow B tree every time there's a snapshot created. And if a snapshot is deleted, we can merge those two together to make things all congruent once again. And so when you read the metadata and there's a miss, it'll just traverse the chain down until it finds the right place to read. All right, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna try a live demo here. And let me get to, I have a VM. All right, can somebody let me know if they can see this? This if it's presenting all right? Yep, it's fine. Cool, yes, thanks. You can see it. Perfect. All right, so I have this VM here that I created just for the sake of this demo. I have a small one gigabyte volume that I formatted with ReFS. I've called it R. And on that volume is just a simple text file called changelog. And that changelog looks like this. It's just some ASCII art of a dog. And what we're going to do is take some snapshots of that file and show you how this works. So as I said earlier, this is built into REFS util. And so if you go to REFS, REFS util, it's in a system32 file, and you can do a dash help to look at all the commands. Uh, some of you are familiar with that salvage operation. So if like a volume's not mounting, you can salvage data out of it. But there's this new one called stream snapshot at the bottom there, and that's what we're going to be using. So we'll take a snapshot of this first file, and you just do that with REFS so util stream snapshot, and it's this dash C, C for create. We'll call it first snap, and then we're doing it on this changelog file in the R drive. And super fast. And then I'm going to make some changes to the file. So I'll just write something like, this is a snapshot terrier. And 
then we'll take another snapshot and we'll call this one uh, snack it second snap with that dash C for create. And that's successfully. And then let's show some changes in this. So to show the changes, you use a slash Q, Q is for query, and then you can choose the snapshot. And you can see there's just some different clusters, one cluster in here that's different. If I hadn't made those changes, what you would see is that it would just give a message saying there's no delta between these two. And then to list all the snapshots in a file, you can do this dash L and star will list all of them. So you can list them by name if you want, but the star will list all of them. And so you can see how we have this first snap that we took and then this second snap also that we took and their stream size is slightly different because of the changes that we made between them. Now you can also delete and that's with that slash D and we'll delete the first snap. And then I'm going to relist those just to show you that, yep, first snap's gone. It was up here when we listed them first, then we deleted. Now it's no longer there. And that is my demo of RFS snapshots. So we hope this is a useful feature to you. Um, this can be used either just with RFS util or there's a developer API. So if you want to learn more about that, like if you want to integrate it into some of your software solutions, you can go for it. We'd love to hear feedback on how this can be more useful and um, how you're going to use it. And that concludes my demo. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, we want you guys to try these out. Uh, these are available in the latest Insider builds um, or with Windows Server 2022 with the GA release. And um, yeah, let us know, give us feedback. We'd love to hear it. Also have some time now for some questions in the chat or questions over audio if you'd like. Uh, thanks. This was uh, this was. Thank you so much. This was surprisingly interesting and short, so we have a lot of time for questions. Um, I have one in the chat. Uh, so what actually happens if SYN provisioning is unwatched and you actually use up the whole pool? Will S2D guard against taking up your physical disk reserve capacity? Um, Tina, can you can you uh, do something with that question? Yeah, sorry, let me just take a quick look at the question. Um, it will not eat into the reserve, so the reserve is off limits still. OK, yeah, but uh, if I understand it, you, there is no real reserve or uh, in, in today, if you want the parallel rebuild happening, if that's a reserve, what what we are talking about, it's just uh, unused space, so it could it could be used or not, or do I misunderstand the concept? So within provisioning, um, one thing that we have kind of in place is the alert that I mentioned. So mm -hmm. uh, if your actual physical use um, space is going above 70% of um, your actual pool capacity, then you will get that alert and it won't be cleared until uh, you dip below that threshold. So that is one thing that is guarding against, um, but it's not a like hard limit by any means. We won't stop you from filling up your volume, um, but it's meant to be there to act as a guideline. And for the reserved space, I believe that is something that um, the provisioning will still respect. So um, the amount of free and usable space is without, like it already takes into consideration the amount that is in reserve. OK, um, next thing I had in mind when I saw you uh, creating a, a nested mirror uh, volume, great that it's now implemented in uh, in Windows Admin Center. And I assume you also create um, now the the two tiers we need for a two node cluster or even for a four node stretched, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of the tiers are created um, by enable STD. Uh, so the tiers already exist, but if you need to set the like um, settings for thin provisioning, WAC will take care of all of that. So you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about that. 
Okay, very cool. Yeah, the tiers exist today in Windows Server 2022 with Storage Spaces Direct and Azure Stack HCI, but you don't have it visible in Windows yeah, Admin Center. And this yeah. is what uh, what changes here. Uh, but uh, Tina, I have also a question about the thin provisioning stuff. I played already a little bit around with it um, in Azure Stack uh, 21 H2 preview, and it works fine. It's great. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, if I um, if I work with this and I upgrade a cluster from Azure Stack HCI 20H2 to 21H2, the pool level first stays on Windows Server 2019. This is the name of the pool level. I have to change it to Windows Server 2022 to have the um, thin provisioning and enabled, and then it works in Azure Stack HCI. The interesting thing is the pool level of the Storage Spaces Direct pool is also Windows Server 2022 when I enable Storage Spaces Direct in Windows Server 2020. And um, if I use Windows Admin Center to configure volumes on this target uh, S2D cluster, uh, the thin provisioning is visible because it's the same pool level. But as soon as you configure a thin provisioned volume, you run into an error when the platform is not Azure Stack HCI operating system, but Windows Server 2022. Um, is this correct that it's an Azure Stack HCI only feature? This is the first part of my question. And the second one, is this an uh, error in Windows Admin Center? Will it be removed in the future or what's the situation about this? Right, so um, thank you for bringing that up. It is an exclusive feature to HCI 21H2, and um, we are aware of that bug, and the fix is actually just propagating throughout the, um, the stack. So um, it's not supposed to show up like that in Windows Admin Center, and as we get closer to the official release date, you should see that being resolved. Yeah. But changing the repair speed is also supported under 2022, right? Yes, that's correct. OK, cool. So now more questions about um, the thin provisioning from the audience or even the other speakers. Otherwise, we go to ReFS. Re uh, we had this uh, situation in your live demo. There was no data deduplication in Windows Admin Center. Um, on the second slide, it was. Ah, it was. OK, yeah. sorry, we didn't get OK. It was, so it was only a special situation in the live demo. OK. Yeah. yeah. So I, I can talk about that a little bit, actually. So we have removed it um, from the volume creation step, but it is definitely available for the user to turn on if they visit the volume properties page. Um, so I think that is more so just for simplicity purposes and also um, revamping what the new volume experience will look like. I had a slide on some of the changes that are coming, but that is not a overview of everything that is being mm -hmm. changed. Um, do stay tuned for that. We have a blog post going out when um, a later release is going out for the for the volume creation part of Windows Admin Center. Yeah. Then I, then I have an, another question, but I don't know if you guys are the, 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 right, um, the right audience to ask, but uh, in a Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster, we don't have the easy possibility to turn on BitLocker for the stretched volumes. Uh, it's possible to do it by PowerShell, but it's very complex. So two part question is, do you know if BitLocker is support in, uh, supported in a, in a stretched uh, volume? And if so, any plans to, to add it to Windows Admin Center so it's much easier? So the optional features um, field or like the more options field didn't exist for stretch clusters previously, but it is a part of the um, update this time around. So you will mm -hmm. be able to turn on integrity checksums, BitLocker for stretch clusters as well. OK, cool. Thanks. And not for um, not for thin provisioning just yet. So that's the you get to, but <laughs> you don't get thin provisioning for um, stretch clusters just yet. And I, I just have to add another question. So um, what I will be asked, I'm pretty sure. So with Azure Stack uh, 20 H2, we only have fixed provisioning. And if you update to 21H2, um, would it be possible to turn on the thin provisioning on the pool or the storage subsystem and then maybe 
convert a volume to sin provision if it's one fixed provision? I, I don't think so, but I have to ask. Uh, that is a great question. Um, I can definitely take that to the product team and see what our plans are there. I think it's more of a like suggestion or um, some something to add down the roadmap. Yeah, OK, uh, would be cool. Thanks. So now we go over to ReFS. I think there are also some questions. Um, um, uh, Jaromir said it would be nice to integrate snapshots with Hyper-V replica. So uh, any plans to integrate the this interesting technology into other Microsoft technologies like uh, Hyper-V replica? Uh, I, I saw a question from uh, from the audience about VSS snapshots. Um, any plans there? Yeah, so it's something that we've been thinking about as well. So this is very new uh, to us, this RFS snapshots. Um, and I believe actually this is the only file system that can do file level snapshots that I know of. Um, so yes, we're looking at those scenarios. And so for us, it's more just a, a, a question of what are the highest priority scenarios for us to go tackle first um, now that we've built this out. So if you have feedback on what you'd like to have built first, um, we'd love to have that. So send me an email. Um, I'm Ann Hansen at Microsoft.com. Uh, let us know. We'd love to have those discussions with you. So I assume Helmut has unmuted his microphone. Helmut, you have a question? Oh, sorry, it was an error. <laughs> okay. So um, um, I was thinking when I saw this uh, this feature, is there maybe a possibility to build something around immu? In, no, I, I didn't get the word immobility. So with, with a snapshot that you can't change the snapshot anymore. So you said it's read only, so not not changeable. That's correct. So um, yeah, that's something we're also looking at immutability because I know that's a, a big feature request, um, and especially for backups to protect your backups from things like ransomware or encryptionware. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's what, that would be a, a logical next step. So it's not there net yet, uh, and I think there's some other ways that we have to go about making those protected with ACLs and, and the right user account permissions. Um, but yes, that is something that we're looking at. Cool. Cool. Um, so have we more questions from the audience? Because this is, a, I think, a very interesting topic. Just let me see. No, so far we don't have other questions from the speakers. Are there? No, I don't see uh, see them because it's very late in Germany already. We are nearly at 10, 10, uh, 10 p.m. and the audience is getting uh, thinner and quieter. <laughs> it's sleeping time. So if you have any questions for the, uh, the two, um, um would be great to have them now and i'm looking for didier but Didier is very very quiet i i know he would have had questions but he's not here i i presume <laughs> so something is going I'm on in here I, I let other people speak as well you yeah. i i expect especially called you out now so if you have questions for andrew please feel free now otherwise this session is over and uh, <laughs> we have to fill up the time I, I will I will discuss some more issue things later, I think. There's a round okay. later, right? So right. he's questionless. That's the first. <laughs> no, no, not questionless, but I'll I'll reserve it for the round table. Let's put it that way. Okay. But so, so for the audience, we have some other topics from previous questions we have to discuss. But uh, as long as there are open questions on this storage topic, we should stay here before we move to uh, uh, to two other topics where we said we will talk about this when we have some time between other sessions. Yeah, yeah. and there is another one from the audience. It's any way to apply a snapshot to the is there any way to apply a snapshot to the original and override it? Yeah, not today. So that's something where we're looking at yep, going future. So I understand uh, the snapshot technology is very new and uh, uh, you are thinking about a lot of things where how we can use it or how it can be used, right? Yeah, you're getting a like very early look at 
we, we oh, just kind of cool. created we the like basic that. functionality first. And then, yeah, so, like I said, it's a developer API, so people can build on top of this. Yeah. OK, um, again, last call. Otherwise, Tina and Andrew are finished with uh, their session. So this is the last chance for you. I, I, I just was away for a moment, so I was wondering, is there in place upgrade bug in 2022 addressed or mentioned somewhere with RUS by someone? No, what in place uh, upgrade it's not, bug? Specific, it's not specific to, uh, to Azure Stack HCI. RUFS seems yeah. to have an in-place upgrade bug with blue screens. If you if you in, do not in-place upgrade, yeah. So this is this is an issue when users upgrade in place Windows Server 2019 to Windows Server 2022. Uh, the fix is going out, I believe, tomorrow. Public in a in yes in a, in a public um, like Windows update package. So okay. I will I will keep you posted if it does not. But otherwise, yep. It'll come out tomorrow. That's cool. Okay, and, and is it pure REFS or is it a combination of REFS with storage spaces, or albeit standalone or in STD, or or is it any any form of REFS that you, that you know of? Oh, this would this would fix any form. Yeah, yeah okay. this would this would fix all. Yep. <laughs> okay, hey, I actually speaking. Can I okay, have a yeah, question also? Go on. Uh, so one question was like I noticed some time ago that there was something with VHDs being able to create directly on the spaces for the additional disks. Will it be somehow or somewhere, you know, to make it like a thinner layer between the operating system that is running in the VM and the spaces itself? It would be really nice to have some thin layer let's say a thin REFS without a CSV, just sitting in directly on the spaces. Is there anything like that in the in the, in the plan or, you know, just for higher performance, even higher performance to get rid of all of these layers that what are now presented? Three, three. Yeah, thinning out the stack is definitely something we're interested in, um, especially when that additional stack layers increase additional latency, right? So that's definitely something we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I have another one that I get often uh, with with the audience. Uh, uh, so in the moment there there is uh, not the possibility to change the resiliency on a storage basis direct volume. So uh, for example, if you have a two node cluster and you have a two way mirror and you add another node, people always ask me, is it possible to change the resiliency for a volume from two-way to a three-way uh, mirror. I don't know if you guys are the correct uh, audience to ask that, but uh, I don't know who is better. So uh, it would be great if we get such a feature in, in the future somehow. So at um, this time, that is not a um, possible like upgrade or a capability, but it is definitely on the roadmap. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Anybody asked about immutability already or not? About what IDDA? Immutability, the word you can pronounce. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't uh, pronounce, uh, I can uh, uh, ask the question again, but I asked about the new ReFS uh, snapshot feature, if if there is a possibility to, to use that maybe in the future for immu ah, immutability. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Andrew uh, said they are looking into it. And just immutability in, on the file system with, a, with a, a bit you can clip. Is that something that's being looked at? I mean, it's it's very yeah. high. It's very high on the agenda, uh, of course, due to ransomware. But what we're also seeing is that the the, the industry seems to be moving moving to object based storage, uh, and it's a trend that you see more and more. Where you could say that in the future, maybe all backup storage will be object based. Uh, and today, that means honestly, AWS S3 compatible storage. So there is nothing else out there when it comes to immutable object based storage. Uh, there's, there's no comparing offer from, from the Microsoft stack. Uh, in regards to immutability of a file system, you are, let's say, that's, that's XFS, that's a Linux based game at the moment. 
So you see this trend where almost pushed to immutability out of fear for ransomware that you might be losing out on that part of the market. Yeah, totally agree. And, and we've heard this uh, feature request in a variety of forums. And so, yeah, it's definitely, we've heard it loud and clear. So we're taking this into consideration for all of our future developments. If you um, want, please I, make it louder and more clear. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's always helpful. Um, we're never going to turn back or turn away feedback. So, um, but there, there was a question earlier, I think, Karsten, that you were asking about uh, for resiliency changes, like mm -hmm. as, as you go in. If there are certain resiliency changes that are more interesting in different scenarios, then like that we could prioritize over others, that would be good for, to, for us to know. So it may be more interesting to go from two to three way mirror, like you said, when you add a node. Um, you know, going from mirror to parity is a very different amount of work than going no. from like parity to mirror or map to something else. So no, no, no. the specific no. jumps, we'd love to know which ones are most interesting. That would help us. I can, I can answer that from from I have many discussions about that. So uh, there are people who do two way mirror because they don't know what the how the resiliency is and that you only can lose one fault domain and not have anything in two fault domains. So they maybe see that and if they would have enough space, they would change to three way mirror or the two node cluster with two way mirror is is two three way mirror is a is a big one. And we have another problem. The nested resiliency is really great, but uh, you can't do it with three nodes. So if if one someone has a two node cluster and need more need more space, the, the way is to go to the third node and then what is with nested resiliency? So uh, uh, one thing would be nested resiliency over three nodes. That's quite hard, I guess, at least if it's more than a four way mirror um, or change it to something else. But I think the first thing would be two way to three may and uh, that shouldn't be in uh, in my opinion, but I'm not have to program it. Of course, it shouldn't be uh, as complex as a nested resiliency to three way or map to three way or, or something else. Yeah, I, yep, that's helpful. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Carson, but I think the questions about uh, changing from nested, so two node cluster with nested resiliency to a three node configuration, for example, with three way mirror, uh, the, the number of these questions will increase because we now have it's this in Windows in Admin Center in Windows Admin yeah. Center and they will use it more and more. Yeah, so I think this yeah. question will be important yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So far, you uh, nested uh, resiliency is quite hard for many people because you have to do it with PowerShell. Now with Windows Admin Center with a new plugin, it's great. It's, it, it was missing for so long. So I think a lot of two node clusters are still two way mirror even today. But now with WAC having nested resiliency, the possibility uh, we will have more and more installations with nested and then you have the problem if you want to extend such a cluster and even for stretch cluster. Um, with a four node cluster, you can do a four node Azure Stack HCI stretched. You can do a nested resiliency with Windows Admin Center. But what if when you extend a third node to each side? Yeah. So um, this is, I, I, I think also very important. I agree with Manfred. Yeah. yeah. So these are maybe the main things two to three and nested to three. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And also, can I have one also again? Of course. Uh, so I had the discussion some time ago with a customer, and he was, you know, having he was making decision between going to full fully S two D or some storage from, I think it was IBM, Lenovo, whatever. And with the cost of the NVMe, they were able to do RAID six, right? And the cost of the disk was significant significantly lower so why do we have oh, our why does microsoft has so slow parity is it because of the parity calculation that is not offloaded to any hardware or what's the reason or is there any plan to maybe include some special hardware to do all these calculations so was that yarmir 
Yeah, it's of me. Of course, it was Jan Meyer. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> recognize him. <laughs> and I'm Corey sorry. I'm sometimes yours. still but talking like we are that. doing something as a Microsoft. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm now in the Dell, so it's funny. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying the customer had a like eight NVMEs and they're doing RAID six and were they using RAID cards at all or this was all I mean, yeah CPU? probably some special hide hardware uh, from the Lenovo because it was like a Sun hardware right so they were calculating like ten NVMEs with RAID six RAID six it will you know cost this amount of money it will probably not do as many yep. IOPS but it's significantly cheaper than going S to D with you know for the same. For the same capacity, they would have to have much more as uh, uh, NVMEs, and it would be actually on the same price. Yep, that's a question we get often. Of, you know, why why do I do hardware as opposed to software for parity? And so, yeah, the hardware, you know, you'd having a dedicated chip for that calculation, definitely hard to beat. Um, and also, there's the uh, dedicated DIM. Like you've got you've got RAM on those cards most of the time for caching, and then it's battery backed. So parity performance is something that we're looking at making faster. Um, we are bound just simply by the hardware on the systems. And so we can we can continue to make it faster. And we've done some improvements actually lately in parity. Um, I think between, I have to go back, but we recently made it faster. Uh, we made that announcement, I think, on an Ignite stage. But um, continuing to make it faster is something that we're always looking at because like you said we need to, we need to be able to compete with like the hardware grade controllers out there where we really excel in performance is distributed you know three-way mirror highly virtualized environments with a bunch of vms and it's really really random um, that's where like refs and spaces really shines so i have another question for you from the audience uh um, is there a limit for the number of snapshots? I, I presume VFS snap, snapshots. No, no limit. It's probably some super high theoretical limit, but it's, uh, you, you won't hit it. <laughs> one million or so, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just ensure that they have different names. That is one requirement, okay. is that each snapshot has a, a unique name. Okay. And we can mess it up ourselves, or are we protected against that? It's protected. It'll fail if it has the same name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what, there was four features actually you want to see the, the snapshots do with REFS. Are you looking at, at anything like transportability of snapshots or stuff like that, the fancy stuff or? Yeah, it's so early in the development process. Like we just barely got this out the door that all the scenarios are kind of on the table going forward. So we just kind of wanted to build a tool and a platform that others can use. And so now it's just what scenarios make the most sense for us to really smooth out and maybe build UIs on top of and go from there. So yeah, if you have any feedback, DD, I'd, I'd love to get an email on where you think that would be the most interesting. Now we, 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 we should figure out a way to, to do some PGIs and, and discuss these things. They yeah, yeah, I agree. These tend to be very lengthy if you start discussing it all. It leaves room for interpretation. You can't ask for too much uh, extra information to, to understand each other. We should really find a way in, in view of, of even at the virtual MVP summit, it's very hard to get a discussion with each other, right? We need to find a way to get this going again. Yeah, to clarify for the audience, a PGI session is a product group interaction that we MVPs have sometimes with uh, with the product manager from Redmond, and I would I would 100% uh, agree with Didier. It would be great if we had a discussion about that because it's much easier than long, long, long mails. So have we more questions from the audience? Otherwise, um, I otherwise. I have one more. <laughs> you have one more. I, I, I think I opened a can of worm, right? worms, worm, right? Yes. I'll, I'll open it again tomorrow. No, no worry. But no, no, no. You can ask them. But first, uh, the audience: Can the snapshot technology be used with VAC? There's no current integration with Windows Admin Center for snapshots. It's all in what I've demoed in RFS Util. Yeah, yeah, maybe in the future it's a developer stage. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right now it's just an underlying API. Yep. Okay. Now we have Didier. Regards to the snapshotting, I, I also think that the communication around it might be very critical. 
because you, you, you come from this uh, state where people were doing, let's say, if you look at snapshots, one of the use cases, of course, is backups. So there was this issue with you have the software based VSS provider in NTFS, you have the hardware based and, and, uh, as VSS providers. Uh, everybody was very happy to get rid of them, especially if you couldn't afford them or if you had lousy ones, and that the entire Hyper V backup story didn't need them anymore. And now, now, now all of a sudden, Microsoft reintroduces snapshots and is looking for use cases. Whilst the previous years were almost about getting rid of snapshots for a lot of use cases. So it's a bit of a confusing message, I think, to some people. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and maybe some color I can add to that is that um, our Azure Stack solution uses snapshots for REFS today. So that's something they've already implemented in their software stack. Um, but there's nothing to say that that would be exclusive right right now. So that's why we're looking for future scenarios and feedback. Uh, to clarify, Andrew, you said Azure Stack. Which Azure Stack do you mean? Yeah, Hub would be the one that we're okay, talking hub. about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. but you needed to to emulate the 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 Azure capabilities with snapshotting. Is that what it's used for? Can I interpret it that way? Yeah, they use it to uh, snapshot some of their blobs that they yeah, have so on their so Azure stack. Yep. So you have the same capability in Azure. You need to replicate it on on the Azure Azure Stack Hub. So you needed a, a snapshot technology to do that, basically. Yeah. Another another question from the audience, and I think it's already answered, but I I, ans I ask it anyway. Uh, can we uh, trust VFS snapshots as a way to back up the VMs? I, I would say in the future, I would add, can we in the future see ReFS snapshots as a way to back up VMs? I think that's definitely a vision that's out there. So, um, you know, if any software I, I, ISV wants to take advantage of it and build some use case for it, I think that's totally doable. Okay. So I think the questions Go down now. Didi has one more. I have seen the chat. Really, Didi, you have one more. That was not, that was not me. No, no, that was that was me. Oh, Jeremy, sorry. Jeremy, that's fine. Uh, yeah, the, the question would be, uh, I would love to use block cloning, but somehow somewhat easier, right? Because there is a function somewhere in the internet that can do block clone files. Would it be possible to do simple like copy item minus block clone like just simple one parameter to the copy item because for example I if I would like to you know provision some VDI or you know MS labs for example I don't have I, I, I would not necessarily need to use uh, parent disks and then uh, instead of it I would be able to copy the VHD but instead of copying it I would block clone it yeah, and it mostly depends on your use case. If you have a read-write use case, then block cloning is definitely there, which it, it sounds like yours is read-write, where you're cloning a VHD and then you're going to write to the clone, right? So that's where block cloning is perfect. Or like a massive, um, imagine you, can, you have a customer and he would like to create 100 VMs, right? Or 1,000 VMs for something. So instead of, mm -hmm. you know, copying it over and over, you would just say, hey, block clone it like 1,000 times and that's it, right? Copy item 1,000 times. Yeah, well, another feature of REFS is you have this um, delayed allocation. So you can create large VHD files instantaneously. Like you don't have to zero out every sector. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you, right, so if you're creating 100 VMs, you could do that instantly today. You wouldn't have to clone the VHD, but you could. Like you said, but, you could do your use yeah, case. But usually, what I do is that you clone the VHD that is like a, let's say, um, uh, uh, the, the already OS, so the, the VG is not empty, right? There is already the OS. So the only thing you have to do is inject answer file, right? So it's sysprep VHD that you want to clone like thousand times and then open it, inject the answer file and just boot it up and you have domain joint machine. I see. Yeah, block cloning. Yep. So you ask, yeah, but the Yaromir asked for an extension, for example, for the copy item PowerShell commandlet. To specify that it's not copying it using ReFS and block cloning, that would be nice. Yeah, as I far so. as I understand, oh, yeah, I see. right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. just simply copy item and minus block clone, and instead of just copying it manually, we just block clone it. It's, uh, you know, with I all see. of the checks. Okay. Something to chew about. Yeah, I think so. Quickly. More questions. Otherwise, we are we are um, five minutes away uh, from the GPU session. So, final one, questions, Helmut. One more. One more question is in the Q and A. I think. So I have to switch to the Q and A again. The question is: How thin provisioning can improve the storage repair? I don't think those two really have a strong correlation at this point. Um, they're more so like separate features. Yeah. But yeah, use them both and then <laughs> they kind of yeah. help you. Yeah. But you are yeah, not think... creating as many extents, right? So potentially you are not expanding. Uh, to as many extents with the data, right? So potentially you have to have you have to synchronize less extents, right? Than with the thick provision volume. But these are zero zero uh, extents. You don't change them if if there's no data in it, so you don't have to repair them. Right, but if you copy the data, it will probably spend more extents just than you know two. If you, for okay. example, create a small volume, it will just dynamically expand. You will just allocate you know extents as you copy the data, right? Well, if you already have a thick provision volume, you probably copy one item and it will spend like thousands of extents. I'm not sure right how it's in behind, but it would be okay. my, uh, you know. Yeah. I, I have just just another short question. Um, maybe uh, you, maybe you could think about um, implementing the four way mirror uh, for. Uh, a Five nodes, four nodes, and so on, because it's already in the in the two node uh, uh, scenario. Um, would that something you could think about having a four way mirror in other scenarios? So if we ever did do a four way mirror, it likely wouldn't be like the entirety um, of your volume. Maybe it would be a portion or something like that. Um, but that is great feedback and I can definitely take it back to the yeah. consideration. Yeah, there are some customers uh, th that they assume that more than two nodes can fail in a storage basis direct or Azure Stack HCI setup. And uh, so with a four way mirror, we, of course, we we have more extends, more duplicated extends. It's more expensive, but we, ha we would have more resiliency. So in some scenarios, it would maybe be uh, very interesting. Yeah? And of course, then in three years, I would ask for a five-way mirror and it's going on, of course. <laughs> okay. So thanks, thanks you two for the great session. And uh, you asked for many questions because you you were you were done with your presentation so early. So uh, we had to, we had to fill up the time, and there were many questions about storage bases direct um, and uh, ReFS. I hope you you didn't mind. Not at all. Thank you okay. so much.